that you have those all set and so you learned about the life of John Keats and I've heard mixed reviews everybody who's talked to my husband has said we hate the movie and then a whole table of girls just said we really liked that movie so you know predictable um, I think but as I told Isaac um, my effort was not to entertain you with one of the best movies ever made my objective was for you to learn something about John Keats. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Then it was a success, okay? So it just so happens that John Keats is one of my favorite authors, one of my, fa he probably is my favorite poet of all time. Um, I think I really connect with the romantic authors and romantic doesn't mean love and romance and hearts, that's not it. The romantics um, in England, that whole era really represented a group who was more about stopping to smell the roses um, because it was a time of rapid industrialization in England. And so a lot of people really didn't care for that era. Like it was like dirty London, smokestacks, you know, there were no child labor laws to prevent um, misuse, uh, some poverty, you know, it really wasn't a lovely time. So what the Romantic authors did, they kind of retreated into the hillsides of England and um, found their homes in the country, in the mountains, because it was more beautiful than London. London was busy and, and dirty, as I've said. Um, so in the solace of nature, they were able to just breathe deep and find their inspiration in nature and write from a very emotional um, perspective. And I really connect with their writings. Why? Because beauty is meant to engage us with our creator. The Lord is so artistic. And I hope when you get to Northern England in the mountains, you get a sense of that, just awe of what he did because it's not man-made structures so much in northern England. It's just the most beautiful landscape of hills and sheep and meadows and pastures and lakes. <laughs> and, um, Ms. Burton and I love it there. Mr. Shelton um, kind of would watch me staring out the window and he's like, it's like this landscape completes you. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it does. I mean, it's so amazing. And, the, and these poets found that there too. And so I think if we all lived there, Maybe we're all poets because it's so inspiring. I even wrote a poem about if I lived here, I would probably be a poet too. So we're studying two romantic poets because those of you who will have core or honors English or senior year, you won't get the romantic authors at all. So we'll do Wordsworth and Keats as part of our England connections, and then you've already got the best of the best um, if you miss out on that spring semester. So. We'll study just Keats today, but understanding that's kind of the background. There's an older generation of romantic authors and then a young generation of romantic authors. He represents the younger. So um, not all of them made that connection from nature and inspiration to the creator God. They, in fact, saw nature as the end all and the be all. But um, Today is, is about Keats. So for the next hour, we're going to go as far as we can. And then some of this we may say for, you know, while we're abroad or if we have um, some opportunity later in the spring. I don't know how familiar you are with John Keats, but I want to show you, I mean, with Pinterest for it, I mean. So I'm going to show you what Pinterest looks like. Um, Pinterest is kind of like a cork board where you pin up ideas for later. When I was in high school, we didn't have the internet, you know, so we didn't have computers. I'm that old, so 
we had cork boards in our room. And if there was a magazine article or something or a picture or a ticket stuff that we liked, we pinned it to the cork board. Now you have Pinterest. I know some of you are probably on Pinterest. So I have all these boards just dedicated to different things that I like. Some of it's just for aesthetics and some of it is for learning. So nerds like me have John Keats Pinterest boards. <laughs> so it's a place for me to connect and collect all of my resources related to John Keats. So in your handout, we're gonna start with a little bit of background information. Keats, father died, his mother died of tuberculosis, and then his brother died of tuberculosis. And I can skip to the end since you've already seen the movie, John Keats also dies of tuberculosis. No way. Um, I typically would do this lesson before you watch the movie so that the end doesn't come crashing on you. If you're watching it in a group and suddenly overwhelmed with tears, I apologize. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I love it. Um, I was glad I knew because I have to prepare myself for that kind of heartbreak. All right, so I'm going to have you guess after John Keats' mother died was when he decided what career he wanted to have. Do you want to guess what it was? A doctor. He didn't actually have the ambitions at first of becoming a poet. Why would he want to be a doctor? To help lives. To save lives. He wanted to find a cure for tuberculosis because it took his mother from him. But the more he went into um, that career path, the more he realized he wasn't really well suited for it. He went so far as to have an internship and it's just like, I can't do it. That's not where my heart is. He had the heart of a poet, so he decided to be a writer. Now, if you've seen some pictures of um, literary artists from eras before, they're not, they're not always cute. But John Keats, I mean, he's, he's cute. Um, and so the girls kind of liked him because he was a poet. He was romantic. He was cute. And the one that fell for him... Um, was Fanny Braun, who you met in the movie. Fanny Braun um, was a seamstress, but more than that, she really created fashion. So there's a huge emphasis on that in the movie um, because she was doing things in fashion that hadn't been done before. Now, Keats at first was not trying to find himself a woman. He was all about his craft. He really, he wanted to be a successful poet. And um, even during his lifetime, he did have some published items, obviously, but didn't achieve real significant fame and not a lot of money at all. He was very, very poor. And so um, he, could never he could never have imagined that today, centuries later, we would still be studying his works. He felt like he was just really getting started. But anyway, Fanny Braun kind of had her eyes on him, and we're going to have a look at a couple of images here. This um, on your right is the real Fanny Braun. Um, I don't know that level of attraction at that time. I don't know if that's pretty or not at that time. Um, but then I kind of did like the girl in the movie. She's strong, um, but feminine too. A little overdramatic, melodramatic, you know. And she's like, bring me a knife. <laughs> now, the movie helps you understand their living arrangements. If all, I didn't build this into your itinerary specifically, or not, not yet at least, because on day one when we arrive, quite a lot of things can happen. If there are any flight delays or our bus doesn't show up or anything like that, we can't really schedule things for our first day in London. So usually, depending on what time we get there, we decide what we're gonna do with our time. So we might go to Buckingham Palace and see the changing of the guard. We'll hang around Covent Garden and let you have some lunch. Um, we might walk through Trafalgar Square and see some of the more iconic sites of London. 
But that afternoon, if all goes well, we've landed on time and still have some energy, I hope that we can actually go to John Keats' house. This house is still there in London, and you can go in it, and I think it's cool. Mr. Zeffo is like, eh, it's a house. I'm like, you're just not in love with John Keats like I am, because I go in, I'm like, that was his actual fireplace, you know. <laughs> but it's in a really posh part of town, and when you come out of his house, there's all these crepe stands and macarons, and, you know, we could have a nice um, afternoon snack there as well. So that's my hope and plan, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about it just so you understand. Um, this is made to look like a very nice estate, but what you know from the film is it's actually two homes cut down the middle. Now they might have two back entrances that are separate, but in the front it would look like one big home. So see you look wealthy if you say, this is where I live, but you go in the back and it's only half yours, right? So Fanny Braun's family lived on one side. Who lived on the other side? Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, the infamous Charles Brown, Scotsman, rough around the edges, and he had some money. So he allows Keats to live with him because Keats didn't have money, couldn't really afford a place of his own. I don't know how much rent he paid Charles, but they worked. Um, in sharing a property because they were both poets. So they had that relationship kind of like C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien where, you know, they kind of inspire each other, iron sharpens iron, they work together, they share poetry with each other. What do you think of this? I don't know, I might try that, you know, and that's why, why they were fitting together. But in that close proximity to Fanny Braun, that's where their relationship really developed. Certainly the movie romanticizes reality, but I'm okay with that because it makes for a pretty story. <laughs> but them on two sides of the wall, just like, I know you're over there. It's just, it's, it's, it's funny. I don't know how much reality real is there. That definitely happens. Okay, but let me ask you a question. If John Keats loved Fanny Braun and Fanny Braun loved John Keats, why did he not want to marry her? He didn't have any money. What could he offer her? He was a penniless poet. And we see him then having to nurse his brother through his um, ordeal with tuberculosis. And so then there's that fateful day when Keats himself coughs into a napkin and it's blood the telltale sign of tuberculosis. I want you to imagine that moment of epiphany because he already watched his mother go through this and he already nursed his brother through this. So he knows the longevity of it tentatively. He knows every symptom of it. He knows every ache and pain. And to know, oh my gosh, like this is my end, it would be crushing. So of course, how could he marry Fanny Braun saying, I have no money and I'm gonna die. But, you know, I mean, so don't think he didn't care about her. It's just he didn't think that that would be best for her. Now, um, we know too that John Keats, um, after that, started getting really, really sick. And the England, England, especially in the winter, is cold. It's always rainy. That's not good for the lungs if you have a lung disease. So his friends pitch in and give him money to go where? Italy. To Italy, to Rome. And so he takes a place there um, with Shelley, who is another famous romantic poet. And there they live at what is now the bottom of the Spanish steps. How many of you have been to Rome? Okay, you've been to the Spanish steps then because it's one of the most important places in all of Rome. Keats's house is there. Like I went up into his room and looked out the window and you can see the whole Spanish steps. Like now, that would be some of the most prime real estate in the world if it were a private residence, but they've made it into a museum so you can actually go in there. And I totally geeked out going into his home and they said the ceiling hasn't changed at all, so this was the very ceiling that Keats would have been lying under when he died. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I get teary in a museum in Rome, you know. But um, he did die in 
Rome. Probably his life was extended several months by going there, um, but it wasn't enough to bring him to total recovery. Let's look at his gravestone. So this is the gravestone of John Keats, and look at the bottom here. This is what he wanted written on his gravestone, and he did die in 1821. And it says, here lies one whose name was writ in water, writ as in written. What happens if you write in water? Anything? I'm, I'm ripples. Ripples, and then it just dies. It's gone. So what does this tell you that John Keats thought was true of himself? He thought he was terrible. He, he was irrelevant. He, he thought he was completely irrelevant. Like, born, wrote a few things, met a girl, died. The end, little ripple in the water, nothing to remain. That's why it's really cool to think of the ability of writing to immortalize a person. Because his name lives on, he's famous. Everybody who ever studies British literature or romanticism will study John Keats. And his poetry is profound. I actually feel a little bit robbed because if he was able to, um, do, uh, to write this kind of quality and this much um, at his age, what might we have had he lived to a ripe old age? Okay, can you put together how old he was when he died? 24, I think. Maybe 25. But that's really young. That's actually hard for me to swallow because I'm like, well, I feel slightly underachieved because, I mean, he had already done so much um, by that age. It's really cool. With all that in mind, we're going to have our look at, have a look at one of his poems. I hope you'll be able to hear this with that noisy thing. All right, what year did he die again? What? Okay, and then what year does it say that this poem, When I Have Fears, was written? Okay. So he already knew that he was going to die when he wrote this poem. He had already, he had just found out that he had tuberculosis, the early signs of it. Okay, so let's listen um, to this poem. that I may cease to be. It's on the page with the picture of John Keats. So you're going to be flipping back and forth between the actual poem for reference and the questions about it. 
All right, look at those first, um, that first line. When I have fears, then I may cease to be. Then everything in between gives us some ideas of what those specific fears are. And then skip to the dash in the third line up from the bottom. Then on the shore of the wild, wide world, I stand alone and think to love and fame to nothingness do sink. So that's really our whole independent clause there, but it's a, it's a if this, then this, or when this happens, then this is true. So let's look at the first few lines and see if we can get to what is he afraid of happening before he, or what is he afraid of not accomplishing before he dies? when I have fears that I may cease to be, to die. Any ideas? Exactly. He's afraid he's not going to have a chance to write everything that's in his brain. And that's where I feel like we missed out a little bit. If he had stories upon stories upon stories and poetry in his head and didn't actually have time to write it all down before he died, and we missed out on a lot. I honestly feel, feel a little bit opposite. I love to write. And I like to write. I mean, I enjoy it. I think I'm okay at it, but I don't have a, I don't feel like I have my story yet. So I keep waiting like, okay, something really awesome is going to happen and then I can write about it, you know. But I don't have my story. He's, he's the opposite. He's filled with so many stories. He doesn't have time to get them down on paper. What else is he afraid of will happen? He'll die before it happens. Before, sorry. Before the, what of his point? Oh, could be. Yeah, all of that is tied into one, the books and caricature and everything. And then what else besides that? He won't be able to his Yes. He will have, he will not have consummated love. Okay, so there is a degree of accomplishment in that he found someone who would love him back. We call that requited love. She loves him, he loves her, their love is requited. But if they could never marry, then they would never become physically one, spiritually one. Their relationship is never consummated. So he understood that he would never experience the fullness of what love could be in a marriage scenario. Now look at the last line. With that realization that he could die before this and that happen, then on the shore of the wide world, I stand alone. That's a highly visual statement. The imagery there you know, paints a picture of the ocean is maybe eternity or the afterlife or death. The earth represents the boundaries of time and place. So he's standing on the edge of the shore, recognizing he's going to die, he's going to pass over, but he finds himself very isolated and alone there. Not because he had no friends, not because he had no one who loved him, but because nobody can really walk this path with him. Nobody can share the experience with him, the knowledge of knowing he's going to die, and the sickness, and the sorrow, and the suffering, and all of that. Nobody can really walk that with him or understand it fully. So there he stands completely alone until love and fame to, no to nothingness do sink. So the two things he really feels that he'll never accomplish is love and fame, which are tied into the very things he's afraid of will never happen to him. Fame from a prolific life of a writer 
and love, total, complete, perfected, united love. It's kind of somber um, because this is his realization of his own death to come. How do we make a universal message out of this? How, how does it apply to all people of all time? It doesn't have to be a positive message, but what is his message? I heard something. What? You eventually die. You eventually die. And he would even say, what is that like? Lonely, isolated. You approach death all by yourself. Nobody gets to walk that with you. Okay. The next poem, and this is probably where we're going to spend the remainder of our time today, it's, it's the best one. It's my, it's my second favorite poem of all time. So while Keats is my favorite poet, there is a poem or two that I like equally or better than this one. But this is for sure top three poems of all time written by John Keats. Yes? What's your all-time favorite? I love the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. Um, it's just complex and really, really unique. People used to fill up whole football stadiums to hear T.S. Eliot when he came to America, when he would give poetry lectures. Can you even imagine? Hey, poetry lecture, let's see how many people come. Like three. <laughs> then they're packing out football stadiums, so that's a good one for another day. So this is called Ode to a Nightingale. So find this one. It's the first poem in your packet. It's a little bit long. So we're going to listen to it um, in two ways. Um, do you know Benedict Cumberbatch? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sherlock. Um, Benedict Cumberbatch is a fantastic um, British uh, actor, and he actually was Hamlet in a stage version in London last year, and it, they were actually able to stream it live to AMC on Barrett Parkway. So I'm a big Benedict Cumberbatch fan. This is Benedict Cumberbatch reading Ode on a Nightingale with some soothing music in the background. This is the kind of stuff I could listen to to fall asleep at night. So if you're tired, maybe you want to stand up because <laughs> I don't want you to fall asleep. Also, while Keats was writing this, he was in his yard, the White House that you saw. Um, it has a tree in the front yard. And Charles Brown wrote about this later. So a little background to the poem. Charles Brown said he saw John Keats gather up some paper and a writing utensil. And he goes out and he sits under the tree and that tree is still there. He sat there for about three or four hours, writing, sleeping, writing, sleeping, I'm not sure. When he comes inside, he starts tucking away all of the little papers. And Charles Brown said, so show me what you've been working on. He's like, no, no, it's no good. I, I mean, like, he, you know, if you do something and you feel insecure about it, like you write something or you draw something, you know, he's like, uh -uh, I'm not, I don't want to share it, you know. So he didn't, but years later, we have it published. It is the most beautiful poem. And I think of just how could he ever have been insecure about that? Like, how would you write this and not know you were awesome? <laughs> you know? But um, he was listening to the song of a nightingale while he was, while he was there. So I'm going to play the nightingale sound, um, the bird song, while we're listening to Benedict Cumberbatch read this poem. Thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that 
thou like winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green, and shadows in umbrellas, singest of summer in full-throated knees. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance a provincial song in sunburn.
the Nightingale song to end when it did because he says fled is that music do I wake or sleep um, but lovely lovely poem so we're gonna kind of go at it a little bit at a time um, because to understand this one you really have to break it down and spend some time with it here's a little painting someone did I don't think I can show it all at once, but the nightingale is singing up in the tree, and then you have the queen, the moon, and her fairy band of stars around her, so we'll get to the explanation of that in a little bit, but I'll have that up all the going through it. Okay, so for this one, again, you've got lots of questions to address about the poem, so you can um, kind of flip back and forth to the poem and the questions. So, first you're labeling the tone of the stanza or explaining the mood and mindset of the speaker in the first stanza. So, it reads, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains. So, that establishes mood and tone right away. A feeling of heartache, drowsiness, a numbness, almost as if he had drunk of hemlock, which is what, do you know? Poison. Poison, or emptied opiate into the drains or veins. Opiate would be drugs. So he feels um, a feeling of like intoxication, but it's not, it's not a good high. He feels numbed by it. It, every way that he describes it is somber and dark and a little bit detached from reality, okay? It's kind of that moment when you're sort of half asleep or you become aware that you've been sleeping on your hand and your hand doesn't quite have all of its feelings, so it's numbness, it's, it's kind of this almost otherworldly, like not really in touch with things. Then... He brings his attention to the nightingale. Notice that the title of the poem is Ode to a Nightingale. An ode is very formal. Um, it has a regular rhythm and rhyme scheme, and it is written in tribute to something else. So he's talking to the nightingale when he says, um, not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness that thou light winged dry out of the trees and some melodious plot, blah, 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 singest of summer in full-throated ease. Now, don't let the words happy convince you that that's how the author feels. He's almost like, I'm, I am just delighted that you, bird, get to enjoy some happiness because you get to sing of the summer and, and you have such a, an easiness about it. Like the bird is able just to belt it out. Like how I'm super jealous of those that can really sing. I'm like, that must feel really good just to be able to like, blah, <laughs> you know, because um, it's it sounds really pretty. So he's like, lucky for you, you get to sing. Do you know what it's called when you talk, a literary term, when you address or talk to someone or something that is incapable of responding back? Apostrophe. Oh, well done. <laughs> Apostrophe. Yes. Oh, yeah. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Apostrophe. That's right. Good. So Woodward. it's different from the apostrophe that's the punctuation mark. Okay, but this apostrophe, it's it's if something cannot answer you back or, or will not. So like my grandmother died when I was in the sixth grade. If I was like, Grandma, if you could only see me now. Okay, she's not going to answer me. Or you're stumbling through the dark in the middle of the night and you kick your dresser and you're like, ah, oh, stupid dresser, always in my way. Okay, it's not going to be like, oh, I'm sorry, you know. Or Mr. Zeffo accidentally leaves with my car keys and I'm standing in the middle of the kitchen like, Peter Zeffo, where are my keys? Okay, so if they're absent, they're deceased, they're inanimate, those are all ways that they would fail to respond. Um, or couldn't respond, so talking to them would be apostrophe. All right. Moving on to stanza two. 
over a drought of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and provincial song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Anyone want to venture a guess? How would he like to escape his problems in this stanza? What? I don't think I'm hearing it. Maybe. Getting drunk. That's it. In this stanza, he thinks of drinking would maybe remove him from his problems. Now, see, we want to think that people that wrote back in the 1800s or late 1700s, maybe we can't identify with that. Um, I think we know that's a modern problem <laughs> to want to escape your problems through alcohol. Unheard of, right? Of course not. So how do we know that? Well, he talks about beaded bubbles and the purple stained mouth, so like from wine. And the way he describes it, for a draft of vintage that has been cooled in the deep delved earth, so the aging of wine, how it's supposed to be better the older it is. Now, I used to work at a restaurant as a waitress, and it was a high-end restaurant in Chattanooga, and they taught us as waitresses how to sell wine by describing it, you know. And so they said, well, you want to describe this one as kind of barky and earthy, and I'm like, I, why would you want to lick a lick bark, tree bark, you know, but, um, but we were told how to describe it so that people would know what it is, the taste that they're going to get. But in all of that, I was never taught to say that this um, wine tastes like provincial song, the song of the South. Like, how, how does wine taste like the song of the South? Um, or it tastes like sunburnt mirth. Mirth is, is like bliss, sunburnt bliss. The idea of being on a beach, like that's what the wine tastes like? Interesting. It tastes of flora. Flora is flowers and the country green. That one I understand a little bit more. The floral notes, that's fine. This is what we call synesthesia. Write it down, synesthesia. It's um, S-Y-N-E-S-T-H-E. S-I-A. It's a literary technique, synesthesia. It's when we explain something that we are experiencing through terms or senses other than what we normally experience it. So if I said, great job band, that music, I could eat it with a spoon. It was so delicious. Okay, that's mixing senses because we think of music as a sound, but I'm describing it as a taste. Right? Synesthesia. So that's what Keats does here when he's talking about something that we can taste but describes it through things that we would see or things that we would hear, things that we would feel internally. It's really different. So why would Keats be trying to escape if indeed the speaker is the author? And we can't always assume that they are. But if Keats is writing about his own life, why, what does he need to escape through alcohol? He is dying. <laughs> like, um, that has to be a sort of horrible feeling to know that you're dying. So he's kind of trying to, to escape that feeling. Look at stanza three. He would like to fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves, who's that again? The nightingale. The nightingale, the nightingale. has never known. Here's what the bird doesn't know that the speaker does. The weariness, the fever, the fret, here where men sit and hear each other groan. 